You know it's Saturday when you're listening to a brand new episode of Studio Chatter. I'm Craig Reeves, and today's guest is somebody who is very special. None other than the Duke of Chill himself, Sync.exe. Who is Sync.exe? Well, he is an incredibly talented rising star in the chill hop, jazz hop, and lo-fi scene. If you're a fan of chill beats like I am, I can promise you that his music has been heard by you. Despite being fresh out of high school, he's been featured several times on Chill Select's compilation albums, one of the most well-known chill music labels. His recent single, Echoes, just got over a million streams on Spotify, featuring the great trumpet player Farnell Newton. Gonna talk to him about how he got linked up with him. He's got a new EP, Cruise Control, coming out July 28th. So much to go over in this interview. You guys are not going to want to miss this one. So let's get to it. How's it going? Sync.exe. Hey, what's good? <laughs> Sync.exe. How's it going? <laughs> oh, it's going good, man. <laughs> oh, man, man. Okay, so let me just tell you, I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan of your music. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Fam. Uh, I've been a fan for a minute. And you know, it's funny. I've wanted to have you on this show, but I wasn't sure if you would accept because I'm pretty sure that you probably get asked to do a lot of interviews. And so I'm really glad that you are here. So you have a new EP that's coming out on the 28th. Is yep. that correct? I'm very excited for it. It's probably one of my uh, favorite projects that I've written. Um, I got some really nice artists joining me on this project. It's honestly really cool. The concept was cool and the development was actually really cool as well. So I'm really glad that that's coming out soon. Yeah, it's called Cruise Control, and it is going to be released under Effortless Audio. Now, Effortless Audio is kind of known for their playlists. They're known for kind of their chill hop playlists. How did you get involved with them? Um, it, it's kind of interesting because um, I didn't really... I didn't really have a way to contact them whatsoever. So, you know, I'm just making my I'm making my music as per usual. And one of their ARs um, contact me uh, via Instagram saying, hey, um, we really like your stuff. Uh, I was wondering what well, we were wondering if you wanted to release with us. And I was just like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, and what happened was I think. Yeah. So what happened was I was writing the song um i just made a complete clean slate on the um digital audio workstation that i was using and it was coming along really well right and i think i, I surprised myself to be honest because um when i was writing it and when i finished it i sent it to them and they really liked it that they wanted me to make like a full-on project like a six song ep of the project just because of that song and i was just like man that's pretty cool and what's cool about it too is that song is coming out before the ep like the whole ep comes out so it's kind of a nice ref uh, like refresher to know that because they you know notice me and all that stuff um it's because of that song. So I think that's really cool. There's always something I really love about people releasing singles right before they put out the EP. I'm not really sure what the appeal of that is. It's just something that I really love about that because it kind of gives us a sneak peek into where that artist is at, you know, like sonically. Because in my opinion, I feel like an album or an EP is in some ways better than a single not that i have anything against singles but i think an ep or especially an album is really great because it gives you a picture of where that artist is at artistically a single sometimes you get the impression that when artists are just releasing a bunch of singles they're kind of trying to jump on a trend rather than representing where they are at creatively so that's always something really cool yeah um chromeostasis oh yeah you heard about that i have heard about it 
Tell us a little bit about that, because you're working with people who I know really well, people who have been on this show, you know, folks like Jay Herlock, folks like Annie Elise, uh, both of those people have been on my show. And then Aunt Shay, who's going to be on this show. Tell us a little bit about that. And uh, when Um, are we going to see it? I can I can tell you that now. Um, I can tell you that. The album is still being, you know, under development. I'm still kind of trying to think of ideas of the exact direction I want to go to. The main concept, though, is to portray a set of songs via um, a different color. And the track art definitely accommodates that concept and idea because you can see throughout the um, throughout the track art that there's different colors and I'm thinking like three or two of those songs will represent each color that's on the track art, kind of giving this array of scenery within the music. Um, And another thing that I uh, also like to think about is trying to share this, kind of like share this feeling of sensory within the songs and within the people that I'm creating the songs with. Mm, whatever happened to concept albums what the heck ever happened to concept albums it's like we (laughs) used to see them all throughout the 90s all throughout the 2000s and it's almost like these days people are so focused on singles single 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 because we're kind of in this uh spotify and streaming and and apple music and title age and in a lot of ways that's been a blessing because it's a lot a lot more people to go into the space of making music and releasing it commercially but in a lot of ways i feel like the album you know the idea of the album has become a lost art that now when you listen to albums and and there are a lot of great albums that are coming out today but a lot of them they just seem to be kind of a collection of records that they really intended to release as singles, but they didn't think were strong enough. You know what I mean? So let's just put it on the album as a fill up. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel you on that. So I kind of missed, I kind of missed the age of the, uh, of creating an album to take somebody into their own world and to have each song represent a part of a whole picture rather than let's just well we have a bunch of songs that we're sitting on so let's just release them and there's nothing wrong with that because there's a lot of great albums that do that uh but i mean i don't know there's just something i miss about about the idea of of a um of an of an album representing a bigger picture and the songs kind of being pieces of that puzzle so your latest single with the legendary trumpet player farnell newton uh got over fifty thousand streams in less than a month the song is called two tones i love the drum fills in that record if you guys have not heard two tones by sync.exe featuring farnell newton you guys need to go listen to it Listen to the freaking drum fills, dude. <laughs> I love that record. I love it. It's incredible. So did you play the drums yourself or oh man, or, you know, is that like a loop that you found off of? I really yeah, I really wish I did those drum fills, which which is cool because um I've been playing the drums for 12 years. I'm a multi-instrumental producer, but I really don't get the chance to play my own drums which samples really do come in handy because if I, I kind of have to think outside the box whenever I'm using drums because I don't want it to sound repetitive the whole time. Um, in, some, in some cases, that's okay because, I mean, I make lo-fi and chill up and all that. So, you know, you'll hear repetitive drums. You'll hear something that's meant to be in the background, but I like to, um, I like to sauce things up with some different drum rhythms. Um, you'll definitely hear that in the first single of uh, Cruise Control. The drum rhythm um, changes throughout the, um, I don't want to say throughout the song, but there are some tendencies where the drums will kind of change a little bit to make it a little more groovy and make it a little more 
what's the word I'm looking for? Make it a little more humanistic. Mm, organic. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah. Dude, I cannot wait. I can't wait. Because if you're talking about, I'm going to switch it up. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> So now you did another record with uh, Mr. Farnell Newton, a great trumpet player, uh, called Echoes, and it got over a million streams on Spotify. Yeah. That was the first record that you did with him, correct? Yeah, definitely. So how does how does it feel making fifty dollars on Spotify from <laughs> a million streams? Um, okay, well <laughs> when you put it that way. <laughs> cause, Cause you probably cause cause you probably only made enough to, to make it to, to buy a sandwich at Subway with the with the way Spotify pays artists. So yeah. how does that feel, man? So honestly i'm very i'm very thankful for him um he's definitely been he's been pretty much a mentor to me um throughout the throughout basically the coming months because so the idea was and we were talking about this um last year i hit him up um telling him i was 17 at that time um i was telling him that um hey i want to collab because a friend of mine who I also collab with was like, oh, he's open to collab. And I'm just like, okay, I'll do it because I was listening to um I was listening to his song with Hoffy Beats. Uh I think it was either mm -hmm. Connected or Beach Time. Who I couldn't also worked with too, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Um I've definitely worked with him. I definitely need to get the opportunity to work with him a little bit more. Um and mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking and stuff, and then we didn't really get anything done until somewhere around March or February. I think it was one of those months. No, 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 it was January. Scratch that. It was definitely January, and he was like, okay, let's go ahead and make three tracks together that's basically going to be an EP in quotations, because it's not. All the songs are separated via different labels now. Um, but Echoes was one of the uh, first ones I've written, and... I, I'm not I'm not gonna lie, I didn't really think much about it because I was just like I, I put minimum I put minimum effort into it. Oh and, wow. You know, I, I was like, man, I really feel like I really feel like I could have done more because it was just like it was really repetitive too. And I'm just like, ah oh, man, I really wish I could have done more, but I wanted to keep it a little more minimalistic because it was being released via chill beats. Mm -hmm. Um, so I let him do all the trumpet stuff and I was just like Okay, wow. I remember being in um I remember being in class um when he sent over the master to Chill Beats because that song got approved and I was listening to it and I started tearing up because of how beautiful it sounded. Like mm. I found the I found a more um like definite purpose to that song and what that like really means to me. And I'm just like, wow, this is honestly amazing. Dude you know it's funny you mentioned uh that you know you weren't really feeling the record while you were making it and you were thinking i'm just gonna put minimal effort into this this is not really gonna be much of anything and and it's always those records that turn out to be the biggest hits i mean yeah i can't tell you how many times i've done it yeah that's how that's how i felt about malibu dude malibu's my favorite record that's by how you. i felt about malibu that's my favorite like, record by you i know i finished that in a day I know I finished that in a day and I was just like meh and then I submitted it to Chill Select thinking like okay you know we'll get a couple couple thousand streams and just like a week later um I was pretty I can't tell you how many times I didn't heard Malibu it's great coding music because by day I'm a coder it's great coding music and I listen to it in the car like on the way to work and stuff it's great dude I've listened to that record a million times <laughs> love it. it's my favorite record by you and you did it in a day yeah i finished that in like a day probably a couple of hours at best that's crazy dude that's crazy so yeah i mean farnell newton he's 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 really something and and he sounds amazing on that record too uh so you just hit him up just like that no kind of somebody having to introduce you to him or you just did you hit him up on Instagram or something like that or, or what? Yeah, I, I hit him up on Instagram and I was a little intimidated because this was this was last year. So like I didn't 
I was, I was just beginning to get a little more notice. Mm. Cause this guy, cause this guy's worked with like Stevie Wonder, Jill Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this guy's worked with like yeah, freaking Aretha people. Franklin. And yeah. Your latest album uh, called Morning Person. I actually listened to it last night. I thought it was great. I mean, it was so good. Like, how long did that take you to do? Like, how long does it take you to put out material? Because you are very prolific. It's like you put out stuff a yeah. mile a minute. I have a very fast work pace. And it doesn't, like, I'm, I'm very passionate when it comes to music. And I'm very thankful that I'm in a time where making music can be literally literally easy like you don't have to go to a studio or anything as long as you have a computer and the right software you should be fine and i'm very fortunate i'm very lucky to be in a time where that's happening um i started writing morning person back in november of last year mm. wow november so that you released it i believe in march i want to say i want to say march or april yeah it was, yeah, it was march. in march so that wasn't very long. I mean, it's like, cause morning person's like 20 minutes of music. And that's really impressive because I mean, you put out a double album last year called Equinox. Oh yeah. Equinox. Right. Oh, cause that man. one's like an hour and 20 minutes of music. That was my, that was my magnum opus right, right there. Um, so the idea of Equinox, and this was funny because it started with one song, and that one song actually got me to where I am now. The song was called Destination. I remember coming home one day, and I was like really, really depressed. This was my junior year in high school, I believe. Yeah, because this came out in 2019. Um, I came home, and I just started playing the chord progressions, the Destination. I added some drums, I added some bass, I added some like soundscapes and all that, and I was basically done. I didn't want to do anything else to that song. Mm. Um, and then after that, after that, what happened was I was talking to one of my friends, and I was just like, man, uh, it, this was kind of like a stupid like thing to talk about, and it was kind of funny, but I was really committed to doing this. I was just like, man, there aren't a lot of instrumental christmas songs out there and i was just like i'm gonna go ahead and give that a go um and destination was one of those songs that was on that so to so to speak christmas ep which would soon become the winter ep as i would add more um as i was adding more songs through like different eps that portrayed the um the different seasons mm. so you know you got winter spring summer and fall and that became the album yeah i always have this idea about christmas music because i was told by a pretty well-known composer that to make christmas instrumental music all you got to do is just add chimes <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know just add <laughs> definitely chimes is one of the things that is like probably one of the things that you would add for a christmas song it's very i don't know i i feel like it's very overrated i guess is basically what i would say because i mean there's a there's just a lot of more there's more instruments that you can use for to get that christmas feeling to it like i would know i'm a percussionist like uh. I suppose you can. I, I suppose you can add Glockenspiel or something like that, like ding, 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 or whatever. I guess. Oh yeah, but, definitely. Glockenspiel will definitely work. Yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> it's like, okay, you want to make a Christmas record? Because I produced a Christmas record for an artist that I was working with, and the song was kind of like an R and B record. It was like a like a kind of like a sexy Christmas song. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how can I make this Christmassy? Well, just add some glockenspiel, which I added glockenspiel all over it. And they're like, oh, it does sound Christmassy. So it's kind of like an old trick that, that we use. Another to... instrument would probably be uh, yeah. a Celeste. Yep, 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 yep. I like that one too. So you've worked with a lot of people. I mean, you've worked with people like the ukulelist uh, Natasha Ghosh, the uh, Indian, uh, the Dutch Indian ukulele player. Uh, you've worked with Jam Addict, uh, the the French bass player and guitar player. Of course, Jay Herlock, who was on this show last week. 
and then Sam Cross and like, do you like collabing? Do you enjoy it? Is that something that you really enjoy doing? Um, yeah, honestly, because I want to know, I want to get to know the other person's sound, if that makes sense. I had, um, in January, I had a, yeah, I had a conversation with, um, a multi-platinum, I think his name was Dao or D-A-O, that's basically how it's spelled. Um, I was in a Zoom conference with him. We were talking, he was giving me feedback on my music and stuff, and he was talking to me about how he definitely hears a distinctive original sound within my music, and at first I didn't really make sense. It didn't really make sense to me, right? So when I'm collabing with people, I understand that when you're, you know, working with someone who basically has their own different sound and basically has a work pace and process different than yours, it starts to make sense a little bit more because, you know, you're working and then you hear something from them that sounds like their own sound. And then you hear something from me that is definitely different, but it just works. And I kind of, it's, it's kind of that process that makes me love collaborating with people. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just honestly really fun. It is. I mean, I, I don't get the opportunity to collab as much as I want to, but it's such a rewarding experience because you get a different, you, it, it, causes each other like it causes both of us like when me and somebody are collabing it really causes both of us to kind of look at our own work in a different way too because you're getting you're getting real-time feedback on what you're doing you know and and so it really can i think make you better like i think that i always come out better after collabing with somebody who's really good uh, but I'll tell you what, though, collabing can definitely be a vicious circle. Oh, yeah. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times people don't they don't want to collab with you unless you have the numbers. Oh, yeah. I, I hate that so much. It, it's almost like, a well, who are you? Like, how are you going to benefit my career? But the way this business is structured, it's it's so based on you know, clout now and numbers and streaming that a lot of times the big break that you get is collabing with the right person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could make a record that may not even be your best record. It may not even be your best song, but very often it's, you know, that record is because you collab with that really famous person. Now you're a somebody. But in order to collab with that really famous person, a lot of times you got to be a somebody, you know, yeah, I mean, probably, probably one of the biggest pet peeves that I have is having a very, very lopsided collab. I remember this one from last year that is uh, very, holds very dear to me because of the positive outcome. Like when you say lopsided collab, do you mean lopsided that that person's not as big as you are or you're not as big as that other person oh no i mean i i basically mean that it was one-sided if that makes sense oh okay okay yeah so uh what happened what happened was it was it was 2020 yeah it was 2020 last year and it was in march right um and I'll keep this pretty brief. So this guy finds me out on Instagram. Um, he noticed that I'm a producer and, you know, he starts working with me. But it became very one-sided because, you know, he's calling me at really bad times. He's telling me to do this. He's telling me to do that. And he's asking me if he can, if I can get it done as quick as possible. And yeah, it became really, really stressful. And this was during, and this was around the time I was still in school. This was, I think, a little before the pandemic started. And it just got really, really stressful and really, like, overwhelming. And I couldn't do it anymore, or I just needed a break. But apparently that break led off to him saying, or saying that he was going to call it off. And... I wasn't a really huge fan of that because there was just hardly any communication whatsoever about that. And 
Yeah, I was really upset about yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I always talk about how people really, really need to be careful about not burning their bridges because what, and, and, and also I think it's important, kind of dovetailing off of what you said, that a lot of times a young artist or a young producer will work with somebody who's not very big right? So they'll work with somebody like me, who's not very big, who's not very well known. And they think that they can just treat that person any old kind of way. It's like, you wouldn't treat just Blaze like that. You know, you wouldn't treat, uh, you know, Max Martin like that. And I'm not saying I'm Max Martin, but the point is, a lot of times when somebody decides, oh, I can just mistreat this young, this, this small time producer any kind of way, Two years later, that small time producer is a household name. And that small time producer who you decided you could just treat any old kind of way, who's now a big time producer, guess what he's going to do? He's going to put in a bad word about you to his friends, and now his friends aren't going to work with you. So it's really important that in this business, that whenever you collab with people, you know, you always want to make sure that you're not burning your bridges. And and look, I've burned bridges myself. I have, and I own up to it. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, you know, in this business, I see it a lot where your lawyer can become your judge, you know, where somebody who is, you know, not very big right now can be huge a year from now. You know, people would look at, <laughs> I mean, I can just bring up, um, you know, Tate McRae or somebody, I don't know, who was that five years ago, you know, or who was BB Rexa five years ago? You know, imagine if you were working with somebody like that five years ago and you decide I'm just going to show up late. I'm just going to, you know, do whatever and just treat this person like a nobody. Well, look where they are now. <laughs> you know, So I tell people all the time, you know, that small time. Yeah, that's de that was definitely that feeling. Yeah. I mean, it's like, don't, you know, make sure that you are thinking ahead when you decide to not show up on time or, you know, treat that person like they're not important, that person may end up becoming important, especially if they're really good. Yeah. So speaking of working with people, you've also worked with artists too. You, you've worked with people like Alizé. Um, do, you, do you help with songwriting whenever you're working with an artist or do you just kind of work on the beat? Um, in, okay, in occasion, sometimes I... Um for one example um i worked with one of my friends who i thought needed to give him a little push in the direction that he that he's trying to go to so i made i made what a six six song five song ep i don't know if the first one really counts it's more of a spoken word thing um i was working with him and Sometimes, like, when he's in the booth and stuff, I will tell him to sometimes do this, just kind of thinking about the songwriting approach to accommodate the beat that I made for him. Um, I don't do it, I don't do it all the time, but um, when I feel like something should, when I feel like something should be kind of, like, there, I really don't hesitate to tell them that. Like, I'm not trying to offend anyone or anything. It's just, like, I, I was a songwriter because, you know, back way back when I used to make um electronic music, but, now, you know, now I'm making lo-fi and stuff like that. So I definitely still do have that preference when it comes to that. Yeah, um, one of the things about being a producer is being honest, you know, with an artist. I mean, I've been in several recording sessions with an artist, and told them mm, you need to do that again and they get mad at me but i'm like okay look i mean <laughs> i'm here to help you I'm, I'm you know i don't want this record to fail any more than you do so do you think there's a difference between working with an artist and working with like just yourself just making a track because a lot of times you know when i make an instrumental track it feels like oh gosh i, I can't rely on a top liner to carry me. I got to do all this myself and there's so much more space I have to fill up. But 
as somebody who primarily is an instrumental producer, do you sometimes feel like you got to pull back a little bit? I definitely have that domain of writing songs, um, writing, you know, the beat and stuff like that. Um, I don't, th I think there is sometimes a difference because, because sometimes like an artist will like, will say like, oh, I don't like this part. It's okay if you get rid of it. And also I pay attention to, uh, I pay attention to the work pace as well. Um, that's why I like working with, um, that's why I like working with Alize, um, 24 seven, because it's, even though like we're miles apart from each other, we just have a really good fast work pace that we can definitely keep up with. And we just honestly click like our styles click because out like when i'm producing music like outside of lo-fi i make r&b i make hip-hop like i definitely have those preferences because i used to make electronic music when i was like 12 13 years old mm -hmm. all right so i asked this pretty much every episode but i want to know how you got started all right so take me back because you're very young it ain't gonna take that long how did you go from a young kid playing with x-men action figures to becoming the duke of chill <laughs> i don't know if you play with x-men action figures but <laughs> um, i had a very vast and interesting childhood um i won't get into the you know dark parts um but so i grew up with um a musical family like in some some way or form like all my siblings and all you know, my mom, she used to play flute. She was a theater director. She did pretty much everything in the arts, same as pretty much all my sisters. Um, so for me, it was, it wasn't long until I started doing, you know, my own stuff. And I, I've been told this, but you know, I, I'm, I don't remember. I was two. Um, but I've been told I started singing before I started talking. Oh, wow. And that kind of led to, that that led to the accusation that I was autistic in some way, but I, I assure you I'm not autistic. Um, but it, it was just, you know, it was just how it is. Um, I remember, I do have vague memories of this. I know that my mom would put on the Rent soundtrack and I would sing to it pretty much all the time with her. Um, so that's basically when I started singing. Rent! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember Rent when I was in college. Yeah, that came out pretty much right. Like, I thought, okay, this is, a, you know, black dude out of Maryland. Okay, he got to start playing in church. And plus he plays jazz. I kind of got that impression. Nope. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was definitely <laughs> just sitting in the house singing Rent. <laughs> so you play drums, you play piano. You also play percussion because I'm assuming you, you were you in the band and were you in the band in high school? Yeah, I was in band. I played percussion. I also played piano sometimes, and I also was in a marching band. Mm, okay, cool, cool. So you are primarily like a jazz hop, chill hop, kind of lo-fi producer. I always wonder. I always wonder when I ask. You know, when I talk to you guys. Like, do you sometimes fear that you might be getting typecast? Because, like, as, as a producer myself, sometimes I get typecast. It's like, oh, Craig, you're the R&B guy. You know, I'm like, I haven't released a lot of R&B music, actually. So, so do you sometimes think, you know, I hope I'm not getting pigeonholed? Um, sometimes. Um, I kind of do, like, the idea that I'm the jazzy beats guy um i've been called that so many times and i'm just like it's funny but i mean they're not wrong um mm -hmm. i just don't want i just don't want to get typecast negative negatively if that makes sense um i want people to see me as the duke of chill i want people to see me as that jazzy beats guy that they listen to in the background whether you know they're studying drinking coffee eating breakfast i i want to be that type of person to everyone because to be honest i don't think i'm stopping anytime soon sure my sound will probably get a little different in some occasions but i mean i don't really plan on stopping i feel like there isn't really a point no no definitely not because i mean you've enjoyed a lot of success 
at such an early age too. And so you've done a lot of work with Chill Select and a lot of stuff that you've done has been put out by Chill Select. I mean, I see your music on a lot of Chill Select's compilations. In case some of y'all may not know, you know, who Chill Select is, they're kind of this uh, movement, I guess you could say, where they have a pretty good following and they will find producers and artists and they will put their music on their compilation albums and they'll release these compilation albums and it really helps to get artists a lot more exposure yeah and i look at the amount of plays you get on spotify and to somebody who really honestly <laughs> didn't get anywhere close to that amount of attention at your age I mean, somebody who's like an 18, 19 year old producer would look at somebody like you, they start comparing themselves like, man, I'm never going to get to that level at such a young age. You know, it's like, where do I even start? But a lot of it is, you know, getting platformed by these people like chill. So like, how, how did you, how did you, how did, did you submit to them or, or how does it work? Okay, the first, the first thing I did was submit to their playlist. They got, there's a whole bunch of different playlist platforms like Submit Hub, Daily Playlist. Those were the two I was using. And I saw Chill Select and I'm just like, oh, okay, you know, I'll sit, submit to them. The first, how often do you get rejected? Oh, oh, wow. Um, yeah. I don't really remember. Probably like seventy percent of the time, I'll get rejected because you know I was still I was still pretty new to the lo-fi community, and I didn't understand that songs should recommended rec should be pretty much recommended at the one minute, two minute time zone mm -hmm. because anything anything longer would become really repetitive. So I had to understand that quickly. Um, and was you just hear like, that, yeah. kids? Even sync.exe gets rejected. So yeah, I've definitely, <laughs> I've definitely felt discouraged at some point. But then I started, I started to realize a little bit more of my purpose. And this happened all because of a phone call with um Farnell Newton. You know, we were talking about the you know the process on um, what Chill Beats does, and a little bit more of like the music business side. Um, one thing that definitely stood out to me was the fact that he recognized, he recognized me as definitely being one of the few young black artists who is basically a little more, you know, well-known and basically getting, getting themselves out there a little more, getting the, giving, you know, getting the initiative and stuff like that. And, you know, after that, I started thinking more and more and I'm just like, if that's the case then I definitely want to make music not only because I love it, obviously, but it's to definitely inspire young black musicians out there and basically just showing them that there's definitely ways and definitely opportunities to get their music out there to get, you know, the exposure that they probably deserve. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people when they think about, I got to get my music out there, the very first thought is I got to get a manager, but you have been able to do this without one. Is that right? Yeah, because I've been really able to do a lot of things by myself. Um, and that's just kind of that independent feeling because, um, you know, as a kid, I used to get bullied all the time. And I just mm -hmm. like the best way that I know I can just get away from that is escaping through music. Um, and there was a whole bunch of different interests that I also had too. Like I, I was basically a pioneer in, of all sorts of things electronically in high school. Like I started my own club. Um, I started like my own group and we basically make music together. I was basically um, a pioneer of the news um crew that they have and all that oh cool um so a lot of those interests that i had definitely came to accommodate my music production as well because you know i had my own videos i just recently started to 
um, make my own graphics and track art for anyone who would, you know, basically like to have it. Um, and I basically take all those skills that I've was so interested in and just find some way to, I, I've, I find some way to basically get that in, basically put that in my music. Mm, mm. You mentioned graphic art. I mean, I did see some of your graphic art. It looks really, really cool. Super cool. And, you know, you, you mentioned that you were bullied early in school. And it seems like that is such a common theme for artists. Like, you know, artists who are some of the biggest in the world, they say, oh, I was bullied in school. It's so crazy how the very things that make people into superstars out in the real world were the very things that got them bullied. Because in high school, and look, I, I've, it's been a long time since I've been in high school, but it's almost like the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Yeah. You know, like you get bullied for being different. And the very thing that you need in this business is to stand out. Well, in high school and in elementary school and in middle school, it's kind of like you're punished for standing out. And so then when folks get out of high school, they can't let go of that. I have to fit in. And fitting in is one of the worst things that you can do when it comes to becoming a successful artist, because it's all about standing out and it's all about relating to as many different people as possible. And because I know when I was when I was in school, yeah, I was kind of popular, but a lot of times I was too cool for the theater kids, but I was not cool enough for the popular kids. That's what it that's what it often felt like. But when I got out of high school and went to college and got into the real world, I found that me being so eclectic is what allowed me to be able to relate to so many people, you know? And, and so in my opinion, I think that a lot of the stuff that folks hated about you or the stuff that people, or I would say your haters, <laughs> you know, when you were young, yeah. you know, threw rocks at you about. Is the stuff that's really elevating you today. Because I look at somebody like you and you've enjoyed more success at such an early age than most people do twice your age. You know, so I, I think that a lot of those kids who, who bullied you were jealous. I mean, you'll be surprised that jealousy can, can really breed a lot of contempt. Yeah, definitely. It really can. Um... I think it's very cool to kind of think about that, like that they're jealous. Like, I honestly, I honestly didn't know why they were like picking on me. Um, I knew that I was different, like very, very different. Um, yeah, but being different is why you're where you are right now. Yeah, definitely. And when I think, when I look back into it, and I was just like, you know, my mom always, my mom always says that, um, you know, I, I march to the beat of my own drum, like, became very independent and I just started taking more initiative into the things that I really like because I was so different. And I actually am very glad, I'm very humble that I stayed the same basically throughout middle school, high school, sometimes even elementary school. Like I'm really glad that I stayed the same the way I am right now because I'm like very humble that all these things that are happening to me were like, it's just like, I I'm honestly very thankful. Like, honestly, I, I can't, words can't really explain the way that I feel right now every time I release music, every time I get those nice, polite messages, like saying, man, I really like your music. And it's just like, it honestly doesn't feel real. And every time I reminisce about it, too, it's just like, it, it hits. Yeah, and you're an inspiration to a lot of young people, too. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm very, I, I'm very appreciative of that. Because I love, I love seeing, I, I definitely love seeing young talent. And I'm not just talking about myself. Like I, Jay Herlock, for example, man. Oh man, when we were collabing, I was just like, 
Mm. Okay, yeah. Um, he's what gonna a talent. Blow up. Yeah, honestly, what a talent. And it's just like young people like that. I know. Young people <laughs> like that honestly just gets me fired up. Like it, it wants. It makes me want to work more. It makes me want to work harder because of people who just have that spark of potential in them. It's just so cool, dude. I, I tell people all the time. I'm like, dude. Y'all better be real nice to Jay Herlock. Y'all better treat Jay Herlock, Herlock like the <laughs> biggest star because because my goal is and and I remember uh, the mastering engineer, the great Chris Geringer, uh, was talking about you know anytime some unknown artist comes into my mastering studio to work with me, I treat him like the biggest star because they may end up being the biggest star, you know and and boy I tell <laughs> yeah, you definitely. You know, it's it really is. It, it, and, and when you've been in the game as long as I have, you see it because it's like I, I tell people all the time, uh, you know, I got the opportunity to uh, meet Lady Gaga years and years ago. Now, she was pretty famous by the time oh, I met that's her. So cool. But if it were just five or six years before that and i just oh she's a nobody some weirdo from new york it's like she's one of the biggest artists in the world now you know so it's like jay herlock that 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 kid is gonna blow up yeah definitely i'm looking forward to seeing that that kid's gonna blow up so you use fl studio correct yeah, I've been using, okay, I started using Magic Music Maker, which was like an old software that Sony made. Oh, I used that too! I was, yeah, I was, <laughs> That's what I started I was on. using that. Yeah, I started with that too, and I was just like, I was making music, I was making, like, um, I was making music with sample, like pre-made samples, and then sooner or later I found out about FL Studio. I think I was using FL Studio 12, like the older, older version of FL Studio 12, Uh huh. and... I started using that more and I was just like, eh, this is honestly really cool. It became really um, overwhelming too when I started, when I first looked at the software, but now I'm like, I know the ins and outs. Well, most of the ins and outs, but I mean, pretty much the ins and outs that'll get me creating music and exporting music, all that. No, oh, cool, cool. So, so what are your favorite VST instruments? Like, what is it? Wh what are the VSTs that make you just want to make music? Because, because I hear like the the keys that you play and and stuff like that. Are are you using outboard stuff or are you just in the box? Um. Uh. Okay. So, last year, last April, I've got the I've gotten the holy grail known as Keyscape. And I've been using that for her. Oh, yeah. I've been using that for pretty much everything. Dude, guess who got me in a Keyscape? Who? Jay Herlock. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I figured. I Honestly, I figured. Jay Herlock was constantly like, man, Craig, you need to get Keyscape. You need I kept saying, oh, I'll get it. I'll get it. I got Keyscape one day. And I was like, I'm not going to get off of this. This is the greatest thing ever. I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, ooh, I found you know, keyboard sounds that I've always wanted. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I was just thank like, you, Jay Herlock. And, and so many people kept trying to get me on Keyscape, dude. So good. So good. We were talking like when we were working on a little project of our own, um, I told him about Trillium, which was another um, Spectrasonic. Dude, I've been trying to get Trillium forever. It's so good. It's so yeah, good. I, like, I, 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 know, I know how to play bass myself, but like, I don't really have the actual instrument, so Trillion is definitely that one substitution. Dude, have you tried um have you tried Moto Bass? Moto Bass. Oh, it sounds so familiar. I, I probably haven't, but I've definitely heard of By it. IK. IK multimedia. Yeah, that's like the <clears throat> that's the bass that I really swear by. I really swear by that one. But I've heard a lot of good things about Trillion. Oh, it's like so Trillion's good. been around for like, oh boy, like 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So I listen to your music. Do you, do you put stuff on the master bus? Because the, it's the, that compression that you use on the, ma it sounds like it's a master bus compressor and it just makes your stuff sound so tight and warm and punchy. I definitely, like, what is your master bus chain? Okay. So this is really funny. This is the, this is the most 
simplistic master chain you could ever think of. Come on now, give us the secrets. <laughs> All right. So um master chain is basically very simple. So one project, the the project that actually has the songs and actually has the tracks, you know, mixed with effects and all that stuff, compression, whatnot. Um, they all get under mix. So they are below that zero decibel point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll export it and then I'll make another project with a little um with a little basically holy grail of a plugin known as uh isotope ozone. Oh yeah, ozone. So there's a lot of modules in Ozone. Yeah. Do you, I, I would imagine that you're using that vintage compressor, right, to to get that sound? Yeah, I'm using. An, I use a vintage compressor. I use a vintage limiter. A, Just vintage everywhere. And I think an equalizer. <laughs> vintage, vintage, vintage. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, vintage compressor, limiter, vintage, vintage limiter. Wow, I can't say vintage. Um and an equalizer and that's it and i also use um i've also been using this software uh called uh gold Foss, and it's basically kind of like this i don't want to say maybe uh, maybe it's ai yeah yeah it's definitely a really nice plugin if you're trying to get a little more clarity and it basically does everything on its own so it's really cool yeah, Brain Tan really he swears by Goldfoss and 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 he really got me into it. I haven't bought it. My uh my trial ran out on it, but yeah, I've heard a lot of good stuff. But I think so it good. uses from what somebody told me uses quantum theory or something like that. I I don't know what quantum theory is, but it sounds complicated so i guess that's cool i wouldn't know i honestly wouldn't know i, I mean, just I've... use it for my music <laughs> so dream collabs if you could collaborate with anybody in the world who would it be like just oh uh, d- go nuts I th- okay um I think the internet would break if uh, I'm being I'm being real honest here. I think the internet would break if me and an, me and Anomaly would collab. I, I've been a fan of his music. Ah, oh, yes, I've dude. Been a I wasn't even thinking about Anomaly. Twenty seventeen. I've been a fan of his music since twenty seventeen. Oh, Anomaly's and, awesome. Yeah, when I, I went, my favorite song is Daybreak because of the chord voicings that he was using and mm. the drums. It's just like it accommodated itself so well and it gave me chills and i'm just like dude um what's another yeah one? my favorite anomaly piece canal is my favorite oh yeah canal's really da, good da, da. <laughs> man i, I love, really love that the one. strings on that um yeah another one would mm-hmm. be uh Kromanichi. I really love the way he Kromanichi's oh, great yeah yeah bro oh man so I think it's the idea of how he's pitching his um instruments mm. that kind of got me into the way that I pitch my music now because sometimes like I'm I'm going to be real with you like I get really bored whenever I'm writing music in a standard pitch so sometimes I'll just go on uh Keyscape and I'll tune everything to 445 or uh 29 cents and I'm just like, oh, this sounds so good now. Yeah, that's something Chromanichi's known for. Yeah, for sure. And I, I've been, I've been doing Chromanichi's a, a real artist. Yeah. Um, who's another yeah, one? Yeah, some of, some of his stuff's a little out there, but yeah, yeah. Um, I would say Ian Ewing, but I'm already collaborating with him. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that person. Ian Ewing. Oh man, he's he's definitely. I would definitely say he's a chill hop legend. Oh wow, because he's been he's he's been making music for them since 2017 2016 and and i'm just like he's so good especially his drums man if you listen to the drums Mm. um it's just absolutely insane he did um we did a collab on the ep on cruise control that's going to be out soon so you'll definitely hear his drum work on there i did nothing i did nothing to the drums i could hear you collabing with kiefer too oh yo kiefer would be so fun that would be another fun one yeah i could see you collabing with him i I, you know who i could hear you doing a track with like a vocalist that i could hear you doing a track with you ever heard of raquel rodriguez oh it's uh, the person sounds really familiar 
I, I definitely gotta check her yeah. out. Yeah, look her up on Spotify. Yeah, check her out. Um, she's super. I think that your style would fit her style really well. She kind of reminds me of Alizé a little bit. Oh yeah, she's a little bit more R and B based, but you know, but yeah, I think that your style could could work really well with hers. I'm definitely gonna check her out then. Well, sync.exe, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been amazing. I'll tell you, man, your future is very, very bright. Much love, fam. I appreciate it. Thank you once again, everybody, for listening. I appreciate the support from you all. Tune in next week for another episode because I will be here and I hope you are too.